be on this top. Okay. <laughs> um, he's also a barrister at 20 Essex Chambers. His highly distinguished career in also includes seven years as a legal advisor to the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, and that was between 1999 and 2006. So Michael actually joined the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in 1970, and his postings include the British Embassy in Bonn, in Germany, and the United Kingdom mission to the United Nations in New York. He dealt chiefly. On the okay. um, there he dealt chiefly with Security Council matters. He was agent for the United Kingdom for a number of years before the European Commission and Court of Human Rights, and was agent in the Lockerbie and legality of use of force cases before the International Court of Justice, as well as in the Sellafield proceedings before the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea and two international arbitral tribunals. So it's a very sort of uh, distinguished and varied career, actually, in terms of international law. Since leaving the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, Sir Michael has appeared on behalf of various states in proceedings before the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, and interstate arbitral tribunals. So Michael delivered, also delivered the Hirsch Lauterpacht Memorial Lectures, uh, which are held in Cambridge in 2006 on the UN Security Council and international law. So you're very, very fortunate indeed to um, be in the presence of Michael Wood this evening, and we very much look forward to your, to your talk tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Penny, uh, Dean. Um, for those kind words, and thank you to Margosha for the uh, for the invitation. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here at uh, QMU Law School and uh, at the Centre for European and International Legal Affairs. Um, it's a particular pleasure to be here, at least partly in person, and uh, it's very good to see you all in the room, but equally good to see or not to see uh, those online. Uh, I'm very pleased that things are moving back to normal, and I'm glad that uh, the university here is uh, open to that and assisting with, uh, with getting people back to in-person meetings. I think there's no substitute, not least for uh, those studying, uh, to, to be present in person. Um, I've been attending some hybrid meetings uh, in person. Um, notably 11 weeks of the International Law Commission in Geneva this year. And I've just come back from a two week hearing at the International Court of Justice um, where I was acting for Colombia. But these were very strange affairs at the International Court of Justice. There were just six or seven judges present and the others were following online. They only allowed four members of each delegation to be present in the Great Hall of Justice despite its huge size. Um, and so we had to play sort of uh, musical chairs when we were addressing the court. You'd go in, you'd announce somebody for the next speaker, you have to go out, come back, uh, look for them. It took two or three minutes because they were usually watching the UN webcast, which is two or three minutes behind real time. So very strange indeed. Uh, I hope that it won't uh, last much longer. Well, it's great to be at uh, Queen Mary University of London. It's one of the leading centers for the study of international law in the country. And I'm particularly impressed by the Queen Mary Studies in International Law book series, which I think Margosha is, uh, is a co-editor. Um, it's a very high quality uh, book series. So I think you're all uh, studying or teaching in the right place when they say so. Um, I see that uh, the center on its website describes itself as welcoming scholars working <clears throat> and interested in both European and public international law in just one of these fields or in their interaction. I'll focus today on public international law, but I'll also try to say something about the relevance of EU law and institutions for the work of the International Law Commission. One of the obvious effects to me of uh, 
uh, what the government calls the departure from the EU and the rest of us call Brexit, is to enhance the importance of public international law for European lawyers. Uh, I think before Brexit, um, international law may have perhaps wrongly seen as something way in the background for European lawyers, uh, but now it seems to me that it's center stage, at least if one believes everything one hears in the media. I plan to speak for uh, not more than 40 minutes, hopefully not that long, leaving plenty of time for questions and comments uh, on any aspect of the work of the International Law Commission, or more broadly, uh, though preferably not on the Northern Ireland Protocol or, or the Chagos Island. Uh, I much prefer discussion to just uh, speaking. I'll say a few words about the International Law Commission because I think uh, it's, um, it's well known to most public international lawyers. And at the same time, <clears throat> it's really not well known to them. Um, despite the ready availability of its documentation on an excellent website, um, people just don't understand what it is and what it does. And indeed, after being on it for 13 years, uh, I'm still discovering things about how it works that I didn't know about. I sometimes refer to myths about the ILC, I'll call it the ILC to avoid confusion with the European Commission, um, with the ILC. One myth, for example, is that it never votes. We did have a vote two or three years ago on a very contentious issue about the immunity of uh, foreign officials, from the immunity of state officials from foreign criminal jurisdiction, but that was said to be exceptional and something that never happened. In fact, if you look at the record, it's voted quite regularly over the years, and indeed quite recently, uh, Professor Pelle, when he was a member, was always calling for votes. Uh, on things that didn't matter very much to him, just to make progress. Um, he usually won them, I think. So a few basics about the ILC. Um, as you probably all know, it's the culmination so far of a long history of efforts to codify international law. They started with private efforts in the 19th century, um, individuals, uh, then private institutions such as the Institute of International Law, the Institute, members call it, and the International Law Association, uh, which is based here in London, and then the efforts of the League of Nations. They had a codification conference in 1930, which uh, was largely a failure. So after the war, after the Second World War, the United Nations set up the International Law Commission as a subsidiary organ of the UN General Assembly. That was in 1947 or 1949, depending how you count it. It doesn't know when its anniversaries are because it was set up in 47, but it first met in 49. It started quite slowly, as you can see. The important thing though is that it is not a legislature. It cannot and does not make law. If you look at the UN Charter, it's clear that the General Assembly under Article, under article 13 um, has the power to promote the development of international law, the progressive development, codification of international law, but not to make law. And attempts at San Francisco to give the General Assembly legislative power um, were, were firmly rejected. So the International Law Commission cannot make law. Nevertheless, it's often seen as very influential in the development of the law. But I think a word of caution is needed. Uh, I suggested a few years ago that um, it might be thought, quoting myself here, it might be thought that the ILC is a potentially dangerous place. And I went on to say that it's not dangerous in itself, it's the attitude of others, including courts and tribunals that make it so, in the sense that undue homage is sometimes paid to its work, whether that work is good, bad, or indifferent, 
and whatever stage it has reached. Uh, this worries states because states don't like to think that anybody else is making up international law, quite rightly, in my view, as a former government lawyer. Um, but states do seem to be surrendering their role to the International Law Commission and then complaining that the commission is arrogating legislative role to itself. Um, they surrender their role because they don't really comment on what it does. They just take note of it or endorse it in the General Assembly. They don't go through it in detail. They don't really critique it. Um, whereas the International Law Commission would actually hope that they would take it more seriously. But the result of that is that it tends to be regarded by courts, including indeed the international court, as reflecting the law. Um, the International Law Commission, uh, a couple of years ago, had to consider what the status of its product was. Uh, this was in connection with the topic of identification of customary international law. Um, it was proposed by me that they say that its product was the same as that of any other author or writer. It was worth what it was worth. If it was good, it was worth something. If it was not good, it wasn't worth much. But uh, my colleagues didn't like that. They wanted, they said, we're much more important than writers. Um, and in many ways, it is. Uh, but they said we must have uh, a special conclusion all about the International Law Commission. So I said, well, that'll look very self-serving if we have a conclusion about ourselves. So we can't do that. So in the end, we didn't know where to deal with it. And we hid it away in a commentary um, where we, after saying that the commission has a unique mandate, et cetera, special relationship with states, uh, the key phrase was we said, the weight to be given to the commission's determinations about the law depends on various factors including the sources relied upon by the Commission, the stage reached in its work, and above all, upon state's reception of its output. And there have been cases where states have rejected quite clearly what the Commission has done. The Commission did a topic quite recently about um, um, the expulsion of aliens, uh, which was very much a human rights topic. Uh, states uniformly in the SIP committee said, this is rubbish. We don't think it's the law. We don't like it. And so if you read uh, our output together with what states said, you get a pretty clear impression as to whether or not it reflects the law. Um, misunderstanding about the commission is, is very common. Um, there's a case in the Swiss courts, the Swiss highest Swiss tribunal, uh, a case which involved the immunity of a Minister of Defense, the former Minister of Defense of Algeria, Maza. And the court had to decide whether or not a former Minister of Defense, a Minister of Defense rather, had immunity um, in respect of criminal acts. And they said, well, the International Law Commission says it doesn't. And they quoted two or three members of the commission speaking in a debate. I mean, that's rubbish because it wasn't the view of the International Law Commission. It was the view of one or two um, wrong members of the International Law Commission. <laughs> um, so that's pretty annoying. And then a recent example is a very uh, important topic, a difficult topic about uh, sea level rise. And uh, the first report was by the two co-chairs of a study group on the law of the sea aspects of sea level rise. And uh, this report reached a whole series of conclusions that delighted uh, certain states, uh, chiefly small island states in the Pacific. And they said, this is the International Law Commission. It said what the law is. And they were going around uh, saying this at, at meetings. And it wasn't what the International Law Commission had said. It was what two co-chairs had said about whether baselines should be ambulatory or whether they should be fixed and uh, states shouldn't therefore lose 
to see if the uh, sea line receded, uh, that kind of thing. Well, we had a good debate about that this year in the commission and the chapter in the report makes it very clear that what was in that uh, study group issues paper is not the view of the commission, uh, that there are a lot more questions to be asked and we haven't yet answered. So uh, it's very important if you're looking at the work of the commission or if you're encouraging a court to look at the work of the commission to see just what document you're looking at. Not everything that has a commission document number is the work of the commission. It may be the work of, of the secretariat or a member or a study group, or it may be the first reading uh, text of a commission, which is still subject to revision. And there the International Court of Justice uh, was guilty, uh, in my view, in the Gabchikova Najimoros case uh, for holding that the first reading text on the state of necessity from the commission represented the law. The commission, I think, wants to change its mind on second reading, but it couldn't because the International Court had said that its first reading text represented the law. So uh, a lot of caution is, is needed, I think. Um, a word or two about the membership of the commission. Um, as you know, it's elected by the General Assembly, uh, 34 members. The elections are uh, very political. Uh, they're according to regional groups, a certain number are uh, elected from each group, a fixed number, uh, which is just as well for the Western European group, probably. Uh, but um, the voting is done um, by states, largely on the basis of exchanges of deals. We'll vote for you if you vote for us. We'll vote for you, uh, one body, if you vote for our member of the International Law Commission. Uh, most, many of the voters, many of the electorate do not have much regard to the quality of the people who are being elected. So it actually depends very much on the states who nominate people to nominate good people, because if they don't nominate good people, there's a severe risk that not very good people will be elected. Uh, the membership is quite uh, interesting when you look at who they are. Um, in my view, about half, no, about two thirds are uh, practitioners of international law, um, whether, uh, well, half are practitioners, half are academic, uh, a third, sorry, two thirds are practitioners, a third are academic, roughly. There are a lot of both. You get someone like Professor Pele, uh, a long-term member, who is both an academic, first an academic, but also a practitioner. And you get people like me who are only uh, practitioners, and you get a few who are only academics, and you get some who are, um, who are politicians, ministers, attorneys general who never turn up, that kind of thing. But on balance, I think this division between uh, practitioners and, and academics is a good one, and, and it's good to have the variety. What there isn't much variety on is um, gender balance, it's women. At present, I think there's four uh, women. Um, they're all from the Western European group, so four out of the eight Western European members uh, are women. Uh, that's essentially because other states don't nominate women. If you look at the list for the election, which is to take place next month, I think um, outside the Western European group is about two uh, women nominated including Professor Okawa from, uh, from QMU. Um, the, I won't say any more about elections. I'm just very pleased that I'm not standing for the re-election. I've done it twice. It's a nightmare having to go around and beg people to vote for you when you know they're not going to pay the slightest attention to, to your qualities, but only uh, report that they've met you and then do a deal with somebody else. It's pretty frustrating. Um, I won't go into the details of the working methods, but that's, that's a very important thing to understand if you're working on the work of the Commission. Um, a very important matter, however, is the choice of topics. What should the Commission study? Uh, in my view, the Commission is best uh, when it's doing topics 
of a general nature rather than of a specialized nature. Uh, most members of the commission would regard themselves as generalist international lawyers, not necessarily or only specialists in a particular field. So when a proposal comes along to deal, for example, with a particular aspect of, um, of investment protection law, we, we had a proposal some years ago that we should study a fair and equitable treatment. That would have been interesting to the person who proposed it, but I'm not sure many of the other members of the commission would have been keen to, um, to take part in, in a discussion on a matter as specialized as that. And those who did know about it would probably be reluctant to say anything because if they did, they would never be appointed arbitrator again because they'd have taken a public position on a matter. So I think uh, it's very important on the whole to choose topics of a general nature, of a cross-cutting nature, rather than things that are too specialized. An example of a very specialized topic that we finished this year was the protection of the atmosphere, uh, which the Japanese member, Professor Murazi, pressed and pressed, and we agreed to, um, reluctantly on the part of some, um, subject to all kinds of conditions that made it virtually impossible for him or the commission to say anything sensible. Uh, but we concluded it, that's a great achievement. Uh, but I think that's too specialized. We, we, we could, of course, talk to specialists, experts in the field, environmentalists, uh, those who know everything about environmental law, uh, but, uh, and, and also scientists. And we could learn the difference between the air and the atmosphere, which I still don't fully understand. But uh, in any event, um, to my mind, that's just the sort of topic that we shouldn't be taking on. Another big issue is what happens to the final outcomes from the commission. Um, in the past, that is until about 20 years ago, they quite often became major treaties. The General Assembly Sixth Committee, Legal Committee would say we should have a conference or we'll do it ourselves. And they would convert the draft from the commission into a treaty. And you all know the major treaties that came from the commission not least the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, uh, but diplomatic relations, the original law of the sea conventions, large parts of which survive into the Montego Bay Convention. Um, but for the last 20 years, very little has happened. There have been no uh, new treaties, except one on state immunity, which has not yet come into force. And that followed a very long process. The classic, um, case is perhaps the Articles on State Responsibility, which you all know are very important, uh, but which uh, have never, or there's been no uh, decision to convert them into a convention. Uh, in my view, it's right not to try and convert them into a convention. That was also uh, the late Judge Crawford's view, who was a special rapporteur on the subject, very firm view, uh, and for a number of reasons. Firstly, uh, if they went through the process of being converted into a convention, uh, they might be reopened. And some of the very delicate matters that had been dealt with in the commission over 30 years uh, might have been uh, reopened and uh, the whole edifice could have collapsed. Well, you might say that's, that's good, that's democratic, and the states have their say, and they can wreck the thing if they want. Um, another thing I think is that who, which state in its right mind, if they have minds, would, uh, would ratify a convention on state responsibility? What's the interest uh, to, to accept under what circumstances you're going to be responsible and have to pay compensation? It seems to me a very strange uh, thing for a state to do to, to accept a convention on state responsibility. Anyway, this debate goes on and on and every three years since 2001, the General Assembly considers whether to convene a conference or to adopt a convention on the basis of draft articles. Um, I think people are giving up. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I encouraged uh, some people to write a commentary on the draft articles or on the articles, and I think that is now underway. Uh, having a commentary on the articles is 
almost like saying these are as good as a treaty. We normally have commentaries on treaties, but to have commentaries on the articles will, I think, be a good thing. Um, now, Malgosha, you you put the word shaping into the into my uh, the title of my talk. So the title of my talk, which I better get to, um, is the role of the International Law Commission in shaping international law. It's a very peculiar word, and I've been thinking about it, and wondering what you meant by that. I agreed to it, of course, but I have to give it some kind of meaning. What I think it means is that I can look beyond the ILC's statutory role of promoting the progressive development of international law and its codification, and I can look beyond the ILC's contribution to substantive areas of international law. Uh, most recently, for example, its text on crimes against humanity, another text that states have not yet decided to convert into a convention, um, or the protection of the atmosphere, which I've just mentioned. Um, so what I think is meant by shaping international law is, um, is another role that the commission has. And it's not uh, set out in its mandate, it's to promote clarity. It does it in various ways. It contributes to the, the architecture, if you like, to the shape of international law. And I think it does that uh, in a variety of ways. Firstly, it promotes clarity of concepts in international law. Uh, terms like countermeasures and circumstances precluding wrongfulness have become part of the common vocabulary, largely as a result of the work of the International Law Commission. Uh, and one could give many other examples. Uh, beyond this, I think that in the Commission has played a role in achieving a measure of agreement on the basic structures or architecture of international law. It's not obvious that it would be able to do so with the great changes in international society, for example, decolonization um, in the middle of the last century, the end of the Cold War, and subsequent developments like the rise of China. It's quite uh, remarkable that there is still a large measure of agreement on the basic structures of international law. And I think to some extent that is uh, down to the Commission and its influence. Um, a very direct attempt by the Commission to do this was its 2006 study of fragmentation uh, of international law um, under the chairmanship of uh, Professor Marty Koskanemi. It's a very remarkable piece of work, this study on fragmentation. I use the word remarkable um, advisedly, uh, though it's, it's not entirely convincing in all respects, and it was never endorsed by the International Law Commission as such. Uh, but nevertheless, um, it makes some important points and is a very useful starting point for many very difficult issues about the structure of international law. In particular, um, it makes it clear in its first paragraph that international law is a legal system and not just a random collection of rules and principles. And that's a very important statement that I think is probably no longer tested, but for a long time it was contested. Um, it makes it clear that regimes dealing with particular subject matters uh, operate against the background of relevant general international law. There's no such thing as a self-contained regime in international law. These things were, were contentious, but through its careful work, I think the commission or its members in the study on fragmentation uh, managed to lay that to rest. And they're not really controversial anymore. And if anyone wants authority for the position, they can refer to its work. Um, then there's the Commission's contribution to what we now think of as the secondary rules of international law, uh, especially international responsibility. Uh, 
it wasn't the commission that invented the term secular rules. It was uh, probably Argo, someone he copied from, but it was through the commission that this term became popular and generally accepted. And we can now divide law into substance, substantial rules and secondary rules. Um, what I perhaps spend a bit more time on is the commission's contribution to the sources of international law. Um, in addition to its work on substantive matters, it has increasingly become involved in the sources of international law. And uh, I couldn't come to QNU and not talk a bit about the law of treaties. Uh, so just to recall, uh, firstly, just to rattle off the, the work that the commission's done on Treaties, of course, the Vienna Convention of 1969, which has been a great success, although still only ratified, I think, by 116 states, which is a relatively small number. Um, that was followed by the, the Convention on the Law of Treaties between States and International Organizations. That is still not in force uh, after more than 40 years. Uh, but um, Following that, we had the Convention on Succession of States in respect of treaties, not really a success, not regarded, I think, largely as reflecting customary international law, at least in its crucial points, uh, but nevertheless, uh, a point of reference still um, for debates. Reservations to treaties, where would we be without Professor Pelle's 600 pages uh, on reservations to treaties? Well, I'm not sure, but um, <laughs> it is a really useful piece of work. And uh, if you ever had a case before the International Court of Justice or another court about reservations and treaties, which you never seem to for some reason, uh, you would have to look at what, uh, what's in that magnificent study in great detail. Um, we had a short topic on the effects of armed conflicts on treaties that was started by uh, Ian Brownlee and uh, was taken over by Professor Lucius Kaflisch uh, when Brownlee uh, left the commission. Um, and he steered it to a successful conclusion. Um, we've recently done a set of conclusions led by Professor Nolte, Judge Nolte now on subsequent agreements and subsequent practice in relation to treaties. I thought that was a pretty boring subject that wasn't going to lead to anything useful, but in fact it is. It's really quite useful. This subject comes up quite often and there's many points of wisdom in what he has to say. And then we've got um, ongoing work in relation to Jus Kogan's, but that's a broader topic. So come back to that in a minute or two. Uh, just on the law of treaties, um, does it matter whether a state is a party to the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties? In many ways it doesn't because it's generally accepted that most, though not all, of the substantive provisions are customary international law by now. Uh, not originally, if you look at uh, uh, in Sinclair's book, for example, he has a chapter assessing whether or not um, the convention reflects customary international law, and he's quite doubtful about quite a lot of it. But by now, I think uh, it mostly does. But the Vienna Convention contains procedural aspects of treaty termination, which were regarded very, as very important when it was drafted. And these obviously can only bind parties to the Vienna Convention. And they only bind them in a case where the Vienna Convention applies. Since it's not retrospective, uh, it doesn't apply to many treaties. Um, I actually had a case where it did apply, the case between Croatia and Slovenia about the uh, land and maritime delimitation, um, which ended in something of a confusion uh, with, Slovenia, with Croatia walking away uh, and that immediately led to an exchange of letters and debate about the procedural aspects of, uh, of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Um, the, I 
think I won't say anymore. I'll wait for Margot to ask some questions. <laughs> On the uh, other aspects of, uh, of sources, uh, I don't have time even to mention all the things that the Commission's done. But one thing that was regarded as not very successful was its guiding principles on unilateral acts of states. In fact, they're quoted quite often in the International Court of Justice, and they're quite useful. Uh, although it wasn't very successful, they're quite useful. Um, other, I'll mention briefly, um, just mention uh, the conclusions on the identification of customary international law. Uh, which I was special rapporteur for, and which I think are absolutely wonderful, but I won't go into any details you can read those yourself. I've just mentioned one thing. Um, we deliberately kept them short and simple. The total text is about 40 pages, conclusions and commentary, which compares quite well with Pele's 600 pages on reservations to treaties. And that was with a view to them being read by uh, non-experts in international law, by judges even who are busy. Uh, and I think that's been reasonably successful. They have been quoted a couple of times in the UK Supreme Court uh, already, but they were only adopted in 2018. Um, I mentioned something we did this year, which was a guide to practice on the provisional application of treaties. Uh, this again is quite short, quite easy to read, and I think very useful in practice. Um, it makes one fundamental point, in my view, which is in guideline six, it makes it clear that a provisionally applied treaty is legally binding um, in accordance with the terms of provisional application and for so long as it's provisionally applied. That was controversial in a sense. But just as treaties are legally binding, so provisionally applied treaties are legally binding. Um, the, there's been a lot of practice on provisional application in the last few months with um, the departure of the United Kingdom from um, the European Union. The United Kingdom's had to enter very rapidly into a whole series of trade agreements. And quite a lot of those have been provisionally applied by agreement of the parties. Um, the European Union itself has a lot of practice in the field of provisional application of treaties, not only with the United Kingdom, uh, but also with uh, its uh, over the years. The, the treaty that was signed on Christmas Eve, uh, the, the uh, Trade and Cooperation Agreement, uh, Christmas Eve last year, um, was ratified by the British Parliament within about two days, and so was the United Kingdom was in a position to ratify it. But the European uh, Union, in its wisdom and its Parliament, decided to hold off ratification for a few months, uh, just to make things more exciting, I think. Uh, but it was provisionally applied in the interim. So for two or three months, that very important agreement was provisionally applied. I think this guide to practice, it doesn't answer any of the questions, uh, sorry, many of the questions. It leaves a lot of questions for, uh, for researchers. Uh, we thought, uh, some people thought we could go through the whole of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties and see how each provision would apply in the case of provision application. That would have been a huge task. So we focused on uh, the essentials, I think, the commencement of provision application, the termination of provision application the conditions that might be imposed on provisional application. There's one topic we took up because we thought it was very interesting and that's reservations to treaties on provisional application or the effect of reservations on provisional application of treaties. I thought that was a really interesting topic and we actually said something about it in the first reading, but on second reading, we got cold feet and we just say, we're not saying anything about reservation. We had a conclusion saying that we're not saying anything about reservations, uh, with a bit of commentary saying why it was all very interesting. So that's a very good topic, which I think I would encourage anyone to, to take up. Looking at the ongoing work of the Commission in relation to sources, um, there are some quite important things underway, 
particularly the draft conclusions on Jus Kogan's uh, that the South African member, Dere Chladi, is, uh, is working on. Uh, we've got a reasonably good first reading text adopted in 2019. And uh, next year, we should do, or we will do, the second reading and complete the work on that text. So if anyone has any thoughts on the first reading text on Jus Kogan's, it's obviously not a very easy subject. Uh, we go well beyond the law of treaties to cover Jus Kogan's and customary international law and, and a whole range of uh, aspects of it. Um, it will be very interesting. Um, the other subject, which I think is very interesting indeed, which we're just starting really, is general principles of law recognized by civilized nations as Article 38.1c of the ICJ statute calls them. But this, this third source of international law beyond treaties, beyond customary international law, that is general, the general principles of law uh, recognized by states, let's say, um, is, is not very well understood by anyone interested if anyone in this room understands it. Uh, but it, um, it's very well misunderstood, if I can put it that way. Uh, a lot of people say, well, general principles of international law, like sovereign equality, or use of force, or anything like this, they're general principles of law within the meaning of Article 38.1c, and that really isn't the case. Uh, there are people who say, well, now that you've made customary international law so difficult to identify by putting rather stringent requirements, we should just say that they're general principles of law and then we don't have to find any practice or custom. We just make them up, basically. So it's very important that this topic be dealt with well. As I say, it's, there's been very little case law on the subject. It's very difficult to find a single case that clearly turns on a general principle of law within the meaning of Article 38 1c, though you can point to 30 or 40 cases of the ICJ which might have been talking about it, but it's not clear that they did. They avoid the issue by referring often to general international law rather than to custom international law. And nobody knows, I don't know what they mean by general international law. I asked one of the judges once, why in the same paragraph they say customary international law and general international law. He just said, well, it's, use, it's, it's nice to use a different term. Boring if you use the same term, um, which isn't very satisfactory. But um, this topic has led already to two good, well, one very good and one okay report by the special rapporteur, uh, Ambassador Vasquez Bermudez from Ecuador, who is excellent member of the commission. Um, and it's led to some very good debates in 2019 and again this year. We didn't meet last year because of COVID. Uh, and um, we've adopted a few draft articles with some very concise commentaries, uh, like the commentaries on customer international law. They're very concise. They do not refer to a single writer or academic. I think that's excellent because once you start referring to one writer, it's very difficult to decide which ones to refer to. And people say, but you've only referred to ones from the United Kingdom, or based at universities in the United Kingdom, and that's not good enough. And, and what are they worth anyway? Um, they're of course worth a lot. They're very useful to read, but they're not uh, much by way of authority. So like, um, as, as with the customary international law text, this general principles of law so far does not have references to any of the writings. Some of the writings are just awful. Um, quite a lot of the writings are in the Queen Mary studies uh, where, where you have two or three books on the subject, I think. Um, and I'm not saying they're awful. Some of them are very good, some of them are not. Uh, but, um, it is a good subject. We've not, we, we've really got to the bottom of 
the easy part, which is general principles of law derived from national legal systems, uh, where you do a kind of comparative law study and you can come up with things like res judicata is a general principle of international law, just as it, because it's found in all national legal systems. But uh, beyond <coughs> that, uh, there's the question whether the second category of general principles of law uh, derived at the international level from international law, things that are inherent in the international legal system. Um, that gets very difficult. I think most people would say there is this second category. Though actually, I think the majority in the commission say there isn't, uh, but the commission tends to be a bit conservative. Um, and uh, it will be interesting to see um, whether we can make progress on that front, and if so, how we can define the second category of general principles of law. Um, there's a proposal for, so, so we've done a lot on treaties, we've done a lot on customary law, we've done we're doing general principles of law. The obvious proposal now is that we should deal with the, the subsidiary means for the determination of rules in international law, in other words, uh, um, writings and judicial decisions. And there is a proposal to do that. It's in the report of the commission for this year, proposal by Mr. Jallo of uh, Sierra Leone. Um, it would be quite interesting. Uh, it would probably not be harmful. And when choosing a topic, you have to think very carefully whether a topic is going to be harmful. Whether it would be useful, whether it's a big enough topic, uh, is another question. Now. I'll just finish, because I've spoken much longer than I expected, and say a few words about the European Union and the work of the uh, International Law Commission. Um, I think its contribution to the work of the International Law Commission is quite clear, and it's part of the EU's role as a, an actor on the international stage. I think its engagement with the ILC by providing written and oral comments on a whole range of topics is very welcome to all the members of the ILC, which wouldn't have been the case 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, of course, it's not a state, it's an international organization. You probably know more about it than I do, but it's an international organization with some rather special state-like features, uh, which give it a particular role in the development of international law. The ILC is sometimes criticized for not taking international organizations seriously enough. Niels Blocker from Leiden is constantly saying that in his many writings. Um, and it's equally, it's sometimes criticized by European lawyers for not treating the European Union as something special. Um, I think the, there may have been some truth in the first of these criticisms in the past, but I don't think it's true today. Even in the past, the ILC dealt with uh, topics entirely dealing with international organizations like the law of treaties, the law of the responsibility of international organizations. Um, for the second criticism, EU exceptionalism uh, may seem attractive uh, Brussels and even more attractive, no doubt, in Luxembourg. Uh, but I think viewed from the point of view of a public international lawyer, um, it's nonsense. Um, nevertheless, given the weight of the EU and the powers conferred upon it by its member states, the exclusive powers, um, uh, shared powers, uh, it's undoubtedly the case that EU practice is likely to play an important role in relation to the development of it. And that's been recognized by the International Law Commission on a number of occasions. And I haven't actually heard any complaints from the EU lawyers about the treatment um, they've received at the ILC. Just a couple of examples on the topic of identification of customary international law. Um, there's a conclusion that expressly recognizes that in certain cases, the practice of international organization also contributes to the formation of rules of customary international law. And uh, the conclusions on 
subsequent agreements and subsequent practice in relation to treaties contain a number of provisions dealing with uh, the constituent instruments of international organizations, the pronouncements of expert treaty bodies, uh, the guide to practice that I mentioned on the application of provisional application of treaties um, deals equally with treaties concluded by international organizations, which largely means the European Union. Uh, and the European Union, the, the, the European Commission, was very helpful in providing the ILC with examples of its extensive practice in the field of provisional application. And also in commenting on the uh, conclusions on uh, customary international law. Um, so I don't really have a conclusion, but I think if I'm forced to look at the work of the ILC's role beyond its statutory role of promoting the progressive development and codification of international law, uh, it really has made a contribution to the shaping of international law in the sense of its structure uh, and its fundamental uh, architectural aspects. Uh, and I think the ILC plays its part in achieving widespread agreement among states and everyone else concerned, international organizations, on the structure of international law. This is particularly so as regards sources. Um, so I'll finish there and I've left half an hour at least for questions. So who wants to be first? Thank you very much. It was really. Uh, you want, can you be heard? On the, you have to go, to go closer to the mic. Thank you very much. It was really great. Um, well, very instructive overview of International Law Commission. I put shaping as a bit provocative. <laughs> <laughs> and I knew you would <laughs> comment on it. <laughs> but uh, I was, I had also in, in mind, for instance, you know, my obsession a bit with law of treaties, that when the commission started to codify the convention, the question of reservation to treaties, it was very touch and go, you know, I mean, unanimity or maybe not. And then the advisor opinion of the, you know, genocide convention. And I think that the commission through following to some extent the genocide convention advisor opinion shape international law forever, I think. So I think this is a very good example uh, of shaping. Shaping in the sense of proposing a rule that then gets general acceptance. Exactly. Or widespread acceptance. Uh, in a controversial yeah. situation. But that's substantive. I was thinking more of the sort of structure of international oh, law, yeah. what we've done for that. Mm -hmm. I suppose reservations are so fundamental, mm -hmm. even if it never comes up in court cases. Uh, but uh, yeah. yeah. Good example. Thank you. Uh, so, in a controversial situation, basically. So, so well, questions. Questions, and perhaps the best is if you ask the question, then I can repeat it, or, or yeah. you can come up and maybe speak you can. Into my yeah, exactly. Mind, whichever you prefer. We're going to come and. You, you better come here. <laughs> <laughs> As a member of the, U, of the UK's UN delegation, uh, were you involved in the actual debates in the Security Council and the General Assembly? And if so, what, is, what was the most memorable one from each of you? Well, that's a very broad uh, question. Um, obviously, I spent a lot of time in the Security Council. I think I was there for every meeting between 1991 and 1994. Uh, not necessarily to speak, not often to speak, but mainly because uh, people were always concerned that there would be a procedural difficulty. There had traditionally been procedural difficulties. Now, by that time, they were mostly sorted out in the informal consultations beforehand, where we really dealt with important procedural difficulties, like what to do with uh, 
the representative of Rwanda, who may be recognized, who is the chairman of the Security Council. Interesting issues like that. Um, and then in the General Assembly, um, yes, I spoke often in the Sixth Committee. I can't say any of it was memorable, um, <laughs> though sometimes it can be interesting. Um, but what was the most memorable thing? I really don't know. I really don't know. I think I've read some more memorable debates after I left. For example, the debates about the invasion of Iraq in 2003, which I was very much involved with in the Foreign Office as the legal advisor, um, where my advice was all published by the Chilcot inquiry, mainly just saying, no, you can't do this, <laughs> which didn't go down very well. Um, so, so it's very difficult to answer your question. I don't, I can't remember most of the debates. I think there was one, for example, in the Security Council where uh, uh, we said that the overthrow of uh, probably President Aristide in Haiti um, or, or the, the departure of Haitians by sea was a threat to international peace and security. And I'm sitting there thinking, no, it isn't really. And the ambassador, David Haney, just turned around to me and he said, there you are, Michael. We've amended the charter. <laughs> but then we amended the charter quite often when I was there. So. But it's a good question. I'll go, Sean. Yeah. Shout. I have some kind of project for the International Law Commission on the Law of Treaties. Another one? Yeah. Um, your subsequent practice, excellent, but they are procedural provisions of the Vienna Convention, which mm -hmm. status is still uh, not quite clear. I know that there is this uh, arbitration in which I think you participated, Croatia, Slovenia, mm -hmm. in which it was said that it's part of customary law already. However, is this uh, also a judgment of the International Court of Justice in um, Congo, Rwanda, mm -hmm. when the court said it's not part of the mm -hmm. body of customary law. So I think this would be a good project for the International Law Commission to work on it. I think it would be a very difficult project. I mean, obviously it's not customary international law because it's procedural. So whatever might have been argued by one or side or the other in Croatia, Slovenia, I can't remember probably, Savinia arguing it um, doesn't mean it's the law. Um, but um, this issue actually arises in a way in the Jus Kogan's topic, because there, um, if you remember in the Vienna Convention, it was regarded as uh, imperative, put it that way, peremptory, that there be a procedure uh, for testing before the International Court of Justice whether something was uh, a rule of Jus Kogan's or not, and that states should not be able to unilaterally invoke Jus Kogan's, self invoking it without being tested. Now, we're doing these conclusions on Jus Kogan's, which cover a whole range of other matters, like when is a rule of customary international law contrary to Jus Kogan's, and therefore not valid. Etc. And um, the question arose, therefore, whether we had to put procedural provisions into a non binding set of conclusions. And I devised a very clever conclusion, and get the number 21, I think, which says that if a state invokes a rule of your Kogan's, to avoid carrying out uh, any provision under this conclusion, then uh, it has to agree to submit the matter to the International Court of Justice. And if the state that's complained about it uh, agrees, then that would go to the International Court of Justice. If the state that complained about it doesn't go to the International Court of Justice, then you can go ahead and break the rule. I don't explain it very well. It's quite complicated. Uh, but states hated this. They said, this is 
making compulsory, it isn't, but it, they, they read it as making it compulsory to go to the International Court of Justice. We want to be able to invoke um, just Kogan's without going to the International Court of Justice. Said a lot of states, including those who'd insisted on putting the language into the, the procedure into the Vienna Convention or treaties. So it's very interesting. That they seem to have forgotten what they did in 1969. And um, they're now perhaps less willing to trust the International Court of Justice than they were before, for some reason. I can't think what. <laughs> but of course, they are other issues which are still unresolved. So the uh, relationship of law of treaties and state responsibility, lots to be written about. There's it. a lot of but It's topics. not really quite clear still, no. circumstances precluding wrongfulness and- um, Well, I'm sure, for, uh, you know, I'm sure in QMU, there's a lot of uncertainty being spread around. But actually, it's not as difficult as it seems in practice. On the other hand, if you do have suggestions for what the International Law Commission could usefully do, uh, it would be very welcome, of course, it takes a long time for us to take them up and then to deal with them. But it's a long term process. It's not a short term process. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that states very rarely suggest topics for us to do. They just complain about the topics we've decided to do. But to get them to actually suggest anything, even individually, to get the Sixth Committee to suggest something is, is impossible. We have had one or two suggestions from uh, UNEP, for example, uh, suggested that we deal with uh, uh, the law of the environment in relation to armed conflict, pre, during, and after the armed conflict. And so we did. And, um, leave you to judge whether it's a useful product. <laughs> but, uh, but it's very rare for states, even individually, to make proposals. Uh, one exception is the sea level rise proposal, where uh, Micronesia and one or two other states did make a very concrete proposal. Uh, and that was taken up because it received quite a lot of support in the Sixth Committee, but that's very unusual. And then just occasionally, the Sixth Committee has asked, uh, or the General Assembly has asked us to draft something um, when it really mattered to them. For example, the famous Protection of Diplomats Convention, when diplomats were being um, assassinated around the world by terrorists. That was thought to be very important uh, to the diplomats in New York. So they asked the International Law Commission to draft a convention uh, on crimes against international persons, which it did within a year or two. But that was in 1971, and uh, there aren't any real examples since then. So it's a very difficult question deciding what topics should be taken up. If you can come up with something, that would be very useful. I think back in, uh, was it about 1990, the British Institute of International Comparative Law did a study, may have been later, 1995, um, on the ILC, suggesting what topics should be taken up and what should not be taken up. For example, they said under no circumstances should we take up the question of customary international law. It's far too difficult. They're completely wrong, of course. Uh, so so it's, it's actually quite interesting what they say shouldn't be taken up. Um, we do ask the UN Secretariat to tell us what they think should be taken up. And they come up with bad ideas sometimes. <laughs> We're going into details, but they also come up with good ideas. And of course, the original work program goes back to the famous survey by Hirsch Lauterpacht, published as the Secretariat document on the whole survey of international law, deciding what could and could not and should and should not be taken up. And one thing that said should not be taken up is customary international law. So again, wrong. Please. You want to shout and then I'll repeat it? Uh, yes. Uh, what do you think about the, um, the International Law Commission as a transnational agent or well, political legal agent? Do you, do you think it, they can be categorized, it could be categorized as a transnational organ? What do you think about transnational, right. the transnational term? 
So the question is whether the ILC can be regarded as a transnational organ, and what do I think about transnational um, institution or a term? Well, I don't understand it, frankly. <laughs> um, I know that at uh, King's College, they had a whole program of transnational law. I, it just seemed to me to be an excuse to throw in a bit of everything, mix it up, and do whatever the professors thought was interesting. I mean, I do, I'm a bit old fashioned perhaps, but I do think that uh, public international law is a separate system of law. I don't think it's mixed up with domestic law. I don't think it's got anything to do with private international law. I don't think there's such a thing as transnational law, except possibly in certain fields like investments or state contracts where there was for want of anything better, uh, international commercial tribunals even would say this is a transnational rule and they'd look at different rules and come up with something. It's a bit like general principles of law, but I, I think the term is, is, is a very confusing one. And, uh, my advice would be to avoid it. Are you in favor of it? It's your PhD or? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's because here we have a transnational law class and it was interesting to know what do you think and if you can categorize the International Law Commission as an agent. Because as you said, as I understand it, it is a political and well, it is a, a legal and technical, but also it is a political organ well, in a way. Yeah, in a way, but it's actually legal and it's yeah. meant to be looking at things from a legal point of view. The political body is the legal committee of the General Assembly, the sixth committee. Uh, the International Law Commission's mandate is uh, pretty much exclusively public international law. Though actually Article 1 does say it can look at public international law and private international law, but it never really looks at private international law, uh, except perhaps in relation <laughs> to things like state immunity could be regarded as private international law to a degree. And then, uh, of course, commercial law, there's UNCITRAL based in Vienna, uh, which is unlike the ILC, which is the body of individual lawyers meant to have expertise in international law. UNCITRAL is, is composed of states, though they send as their delegates great experts in the field of commercial law. And it, as far as I know, it operates effectively. That's perhaps more transnational than the ILC, which is really international, as its name suggests. Please. Um, I think there's quite a few questions in the Zoom chat. Yeah, maybe we can move to those questions. Uh, OK, do you want to? Online. We have a fair large group of followers. Do I need to look at it? No, apparently it picks up the, the sound, so it should be OK. So the first question goes back to the work of the ILC and international organizations. And it asks you to maybe expand a bit on how the ILC interacts with other international bodies or organizations which are currently undergoing significant legislative and or structural reforms, such as ICSID, UNICITRAL, and the WTO. Well, I think the answer is, uh it doesn't interact formally with these bodies. Uh, of course, being in Geneva, we're often in contact informally with uh, the WTO and members of the appeals body when it existed. <laughs> and uh, we follow the work of these other bodies quite closely. Uh, the only formal interaction is that we do have visits uh, from other international organizations routinely the president of the International Court of Justice <coughs> comes and talks to us and we have a discussion. Uh, the, um, the UN Secretary, Secretariat, the Office of Legal Affairs, but they're our Secretariat anyway, but the Legal Council comes and tells us what he's doing in his office. And then the various regional bodies that deal with international law, uh, in particular, uh, CARDI, Council of Europe's Committee of, Ex of Experts on International Law, Committee of Advisors on International Law. They send a delegation each year and we, 
learn what they're doing and we tell them what we're doing and we meet informally. Um, similarly, the Inter-American Juridical Committee, which is part of the Organization of American States, sends a, a delegation. And the um, AU, the African Union, Commission on International Law, which is very interesting and, and it's doing some interesting things, I think, send a delegation, that's quite a new body. And initially it was uh, thought it might deal with African international law, which is a rather dubious to me subject. I think international law is international. I don't think it's really regional. Um, though in the distant days, people thought there was an American international law or at least a Latin American international law because it was written in Spanish and had funny ideas. But um, on the whole, um, I think uh, the African Union has not sought to discuss African and African international law. On the other hand, it does wish to contribute the African viewpoint into general international law, which is, is absolutely right and, and helpful. Uh, and they wanted, for example, to establish an African collection of the practice of African states in international law, so they could be more influential in the field of custom international law. A lot of quite uh, important and worthy good things that they're planning to do. So we talk to them, and then we usually send uh, a delegation a member of the commission attends the meetings of these bodies, including, for example, the, uh, the uh, Asian African Legal Consultative Organization, which meets every year or two, and which can be very influential in the field of international law. It was very influential at the time of the Law of the Sea Conference, for example, in um, developing the notion of the exclusive economic zone, as opposed to a 200 mile territorial sea or or just a 12 mile territorial sea, something in between. Uh, so they, they, they can be influential, these bodies, and we do interact with them informally. But nowadays, of course, personal contact is very important and it builds up by having these formal meetings. But the more important thing usually is the personal contact when you can have it, as hopefully soon you can. So thank you, for, or thank the per whoever sent that question. <laughs> There is another question from the online audience, which relates to revision of topics, as the IOC is yet to undertake a revision, and that some previous topics, for instance, the law treaties and the 1969 Vienna Convention on the law treaties, were not exhaustive and not necessarily up to date in light of subsequent developments. So the question is whether we should be re reverting, going back to topics we've already completed and looking at them again. Well, obviously we can do that, and uh, there are examples of that. Uh, for example, uh, I think the, the um, MFN clause was the subject of a full set of conclusions in the 1950s or, or 60s, um, which were totally unsuccessful because this was the time of the Cold War and there was a complete difference between the Eastern European States and others. Uh, but then we took up the MFN clause in um, about 10 years ago and did quite a useful study of it uh, under Professor Don McRae of Ottawa. Um, so, so we can go back to things, but on the whole, um, with the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, it's regarded as sacred, sacrosanct can't touch a word of it, even when we know what it says about reservations, it's rubbish, and totally unclear. Um, but uh, nevertheless, you can't touch it. We say it's, it's unchangeable. But then we study parts of it. Quite a lot of what we've done has been developing parts of it. For example, um, Article 25 on provision and application of treaties is pretty hopeless, and it doesn't tell you very much. And what it does tell you is not very clear, it's a bit polite. And what we've now done uh, actually changes what our people said. So, well, it's not really. Uh, so, so there are examples. Of 
going back, but I wouldn't think it's likely to have a completely going back over the thing. I mean, they did it, I'm uh, not sure, I think they've done some things twice and kept coming back to them, like uh, Crimes Against Humanity, they broke off for 20 years and then came back to it. They failed the first time. Um, so it's not excluded, is the answer to whoever asked that question. Thank you very much. Um, should I go on? May I ask? Yeah. Please. Um, are the members representing uh, different uh, law traditions like civil law or common law? Is there a consideration while uh, electing them? Well, I think the the answer is formally no, uh, though the statute does say that they should represent the major legal systems of the world. Uh, but when you're electing an individual, you can't really take that into account. But I'm sure some of the candidates go around and say, look, you need some more common law people on this commission, because uh, there's very few common law people. And if you take a group like uh, RULAC, the group of Latin American and Caribbean countries. Well, it's mostly uh, Latin American civil law, but the Caribbean countries have very good common law tradition, many of them. And it's good when uh, Jamaica is represented, for example, or any of the other common law countries, at least. I think it's good to have common lawyers on the commission because they basically think straight. Right? Where are you from? Uh, I'm from Turkey. Right. That's civil law, isn't yeah, it? Yes, civil law. Yeah. Well, there's a very good Turkish member on the commission. Professor Nilüfer Oral. Nilüfer Oral. Yeah. Please. Uh, I have a question about uh, the uh, composition of the commission. A couple of days ago, Professor Alain Pellet published a post saying that yes. there has been a decline in the quality of the members of the UN International Commission. So I have two curiosities. First of all, if you agree with Professor Pellet, and second, if you think that we need some mechanisms to ensure the quality and the independence of the members of the commission. Thank you. Yeah, well, very good questions. Um, on a mechanism, I don't think you can devise any mechanism in the UN system that will work. Look at the mechanisms that were devised for the International Criminal Court. Um, they were never really implemented and they don't work because it's all political. Who appoints the people who sit on the mechanisms? Um, in terms of uh, quality, um, I don't agree with Pelé on that or much else. No, I do. I agree with much that he says. But um, on that, I don't agree. I think if you look back, there was never a golden age when the commission was full of brilliant professors uh, and didn't have these uh, former government diplomats, diplomat lawyers like me who don't really know anything, uh, you know, and who, who are not there to get the pure gold of the law, but trying to get some practical solution. You know, he doesn't like that sort of thing necessarily. Uh, so I disagree with him on that. I think um, independence is important in that you shouldn't be necessarily uh, acting on instructions or you shouldn't be acting on instructions from your government. On the other hand, I worked for the British government for 35 years and it's quite natural that I tend to think in, on many things in the same way as they did, or at least they used to. Um, but does that make me not independent? Some of the members that Pele really objected to were um, sitting, were, were, were legal advisors, current legal advisors to their foreign ministries, for example. But in that same article, he says, but they were actually very good. <laughs> so he doesn't really complain about them. He complains about them in principle but he doesn't object to them in practice. And I think having a, a close relationship with government for at least some members of the commission is very important because you've got, there's no point in the commission coming up with drafts that government's just going to reject. Uh, they've got to understand what's of use to, to governments and to 
lawyers and governments in particular. So I don't find that objectionable. Um, now, quality, well, if you look back in the 1950s, uh, half the people are very good. The other half I've never heard of, and I don't know who they were. So I don't know what their quality was. Um, also, I think you have to remember that in the 1950s, it was 50 states or 55 states or 60 states who were electing these people and from whom they were chosen. Now it's much wider. It's geographically it covers the whole world, 194 states <coughs> potentially. And, and I think the benefit you get from the diversity far outweighs any reduction you get in, in quality if there is a reduction. Um, so so I, I fundamentally disagree with him. Though actually that article was quite moderate. He said far worse than other forums. <laughs> I don't recommend that you look at uh, Pele's job blog. Okay. What next? <laughs> Um, thank you very much. You're going to come here. Yeah, okay. <laughs> conclude. <laughs> conclude, yes. Thank you very much. It was really wonderful. Um, well, insightful, very insightful overview and, and analytical approach to the International Law Commission. I, we are really impressed how much we learned in such a, such a short time. Thank you very much. And also a wonderful start of academic year for all students who are in the class of law of treaties and also environmental law. So this is the really great beginning of academic year. Thank you very Good. much. We are really great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you all for the questions and for being so patient. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.